for one more talk in the um, Cloud Native Rejects EU 24. While scientists and uh, astronomers are more interested in the secrets of the universe, uh, Mackenzie, sec uh, security researcher, is more interested in all the secrets in the universe. <laughs> Please welcome him to his talk. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, do we have the slides? Oh, there we are. We have the slides. Uh, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about secrets. It's funny, you know, this, is, this, this conference, uh, there's been a lot of really interesting talks about complicated uh, vectors of attack and, and different areas in a few of them. Uh, this is really the lazy man's version of that, of just trying to find secrets and gaining access, but uh, hopefully still interesting. So a little bit about me first. Uh, if you're wondering where my accent's from, I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand, but I live now in the Netherlands, and I work for a French company, just to keep everyone guessing. Uh, you can find me anywhere at the, hand, at the handles uh, at Advocate Mac. I'm also the host of the Security Repo podcast. It's my mum's favorite podcast. She highly recommends that you all listen to it. All right, so uh, I'm sure everyone here is familiar, but we'll just race through to get everyone onto the same path, is what are secrets? So when I'm talking about secrets, I'm talking about digital authentication credentials. And th these can be anything, you know, API keys, security certificates, password, peers, anything that gives you access into different systems. And in the cloud-native world that we now live in, uh, these have really exploded in how we use this. We're moving further and further away from building monoliths. We're building these um, architecture of distributed architecture systems. And secrets are really what holds all of this in place. But the problem is they're highly sensitive. And as hopefully I'll be able to prove, they're absolutely everywhere. Um, and we can find them in all kinds of different places. So a little bit about today, we're going to look at uh, abusing secrets in, in source control, so how we can abuse them in public places and private places. We'll look at some secrets in containers, and we'll look at secrets in mobile applications. And then finally, we'll have a, a couple of words of uh, preventing leaked secrets, but that's basically don't hard code secrets. All right, so let's start off with abusing the, the GitHub API. So this is one of the more interesting parts of, that the research kind of takes. And, um, my slides aren't showing properly. Never mind. On here, on my screen at least. One forward, one back. Aha! Uh -huh. Well, oh, there you go. Uh, so last year in GitHub, over a billion commits were, were made to GitHub. So it's a huge data of information. This is just publicly. It's happened in public repositories. There was 85 million new public repositories, and there's around about 94 million, nearly 100 million developers using GitHub. So this is a huge data source for us. But there's lots of really interesting information. So one of the things that we did at GitGuardian is we scanned every single commit that came in publicly to GitHub. I'll show you exactly how we did that. It's really quite easy. And we scanned every commit for secrets. And we're looking for 400 different types of secrets. And we have individual detectors for each one. And uh, if you want to know how many secrets we found, again, I'm only talking about public repositories. The number this year was 12,778,599 secrets in public Git repositories. So this is absolutely massive. And it's a, a number that's continuing to grow. So if we look at the years that we've done this, when we started in 2020, we detected 3 million, and now we're increasingly going up. Now, some of this is because GitHub's growing. Some of it's because we've expanded our search. So it's not all kind of direct native growth, but it's definitely seen a lot more. To be completely honest, I, we released this report last week, and I really thought the number was going to go down from 10 million. I thought 10 million was going to be the peak and then would go down, the reason being is that some initiatives that came in, some, some, for instance, on GitHub, they do key quarantine now. So if you leak an AWS key, AWS is actually finding it, and they will quarantine that key if they find it on there. So I expected that the number would go down, but it didn't. It didn't go down because there's still just so much things being leaked out there, new types of keys that it's almost impossible to keep up. And this year, there are more companies that are doing, uh, doing more. GitHub's just rolled out push protection, so they will stop you from pushing a key. And when this rolled out, we really expected to also see another massive drop. But it only does it for very certain keys that they can check the validity of. And we've only seen that this probably affects about 20% of what we're seeing at the moment. So whilst I keep thinking that the problem is going to be solved, the problem keeps coming, and it keeps getting bigger regardless. And some of the scary things that we see uh, over this is that 
we alert people when they leak a key, and we will monitor if that key gets revoked. And after five days of us checking, 92% of the keys are not revoked. However, often things happen like they'll delete the repository, or they'll delete the commit, or even rewrite history to get rid of it, but it's still active and it's still being leaked. And there's so many different services that check for this that that key is absolutely still out there on someone's uh, data. So how does an attacker find credentials? There's a couple of ways. The first way is kind of dumb, but I'll just mention it because it's the easiest. And that's using the GitHub search function to look for keys. Um, there's a bunch of dorks that you can do. The reason why this isn't very good is that most of the keys that you'll find will be in the history of your Git repository, not in the latest version. The search only looks at the latest version, and you're also going to have a huge number. So here we have 18,000 results. There will be true positives in there, for sure, but it's going to take a long time to do it. A much better method is to abuse the GitHub API uh, for unintended purposes. So the GitHub API is here. It's at api.github.com forward slash events. You don't need any authentication to view it. And this is a public ledger of everything that's happening on GitHub, including things like the committer ID and the committer email address. That is all out there sitting in the public. There's a bunch of events that kind of get listed on here, but the two that an attacker will be most interested in is the public event. This is the most interesting. The public event is when a private repository goes public, bringing with it all of its history. If someone working on a development branch committed a secret, then removed it, it went to code review and no one saw it, that's in the history still. And if you go public, then you will find it. And then the push event is when code is just pushed. But you can filter this via email to find interesting things. If you're looking for someone that's working just at Microsoft, looking just for keys from someone with an at Microsoft email address, uh, or you can even use the APIs to search in the bios of GitHub to look for references to companies. So there is a way to kind of bring this number down. Uh, there is, if you're interested to know, you know, what the, uh, this is what the API looks like. And as you can see down here, we have lots of different things, including email addresses that come through. So if you want to have a look uh, at, at basically filtering it, and as I said, you don't even need authentication. You will be rate limited if you start slamming it, but you can get around that by creating GitHub tokens. So quite scary. There is a service. If you want to check if your secrets have ever leaked, um, I have a file in here. I don't recommend this. I have a file called secrets.txt. And in here, I have some, some secrets. And if you wanted to know if your secrets have ever leaked publicly in GitHub at any point, regardless of whether or not they've been deleted, then there's a cool service called Has My Secrets Leaked, or HMSL for short. Um, and you can check and check this. It will query a database of all the secrets and let you know exactly where they leaked to. Now, anyone that's got any security concerns will probably be scrubbing in their seats going, that sounds like the worst idea in the world, sending plain text secrets to a third party service to find out if they've leaked, because I'm essentially leaking them in the process. There is a reason why this is really secure. It's related to hashing and sending partial hashes back, but I won't go into it now. But I can nerd out with you later if you're interested. But that's one way if you actually want to find the opposite. And the best kind of use cases for this is to connect it to like a secrets manager. And if your secrets get leaked, you can automatically kind of rotate your secrets there. But does this ever happen? Yes, it happens uh, scarily a lot. One of the interesting cases with Toyota, it's interesting because even if you have no relationship to GitHub, your organization probably has some exposure to it. In this case, it was a contractor working for Toyota, working on a project, a mobile application called T-Connect. It wasn't even Toyota. It was a contractor working for them. An employee leaked some keys on their personal GitHub account. So this is really far removed from Toyota. But those keys were for databases pertaining to all the users of that. So this is an example where even though Toyota didn't have a relationship to it, their information was still leaked out. Um, but public information is great because I can present big numbers. 12 million secrets, oh my god. But the really good stuff is in the private code. So as an attacker, one of the things you're always trying to get access to is private source code. So private source code is really leaky. It leaks all the time. And amazing companies with great security posture have had leaks, including companies like Microsoft, who I consider one of the most secure companies, uh, NVIDIA, Samsung, Twitch, all of these companies have had massive source code leakages. And you kind of wonder why. 
And it's because source code is so leaky, so many people have access to this source code that you just need one malicious employee or one employee to be fished uh, or bought out or anything to gain access to this source code. And in this source code, regardless of what company you work for, you're going to find a lot of secrets. It's just kind of the way of life at the moment. So we do secret detection internally with companies. And so we came out with a number, like how many secrets are in an internal company? Now, it's hard to put a number on it because you have to kind of pick a number of a company. But if we take an average company with 400 developers, we will typically find 13,000 secrets, 1,000 of which will be unique. So secrets keep sprawling, so they end up in different places. But about 1,000 unique secrets, 13,000 total secrets. Now, that same company might have four AppSec engineers. So you can imagine their job of trying to investigate 13,000 secret incidents. Who leaked it? What does it give access to? Am I going to break production if I revoke this? All of these things that they have to do. So it's really an impossible situation. So you do the next best thing, which is ignore the problem and hope it goes away magically. But if we have a look at this, you know, uh, Twitch had all of their source code exposed, 6,000 repositories, including all the secret projects that they were working on. This happened because of a simple misconfiguration. The Git repositories were remotely accessible. And uh, to be honest, they were pretty good in terms of secrets. They were on the better side that we've seen, but they still had 6,600 exposed secrets in their repositories, including 194 AWS keys and even four Stripe keys. So you know, this is, and this is a good company, but it just goes to show how often it is. So getting access to this private source code is a huge priority for attackers. Um, I have a funny example here. So one of the ways that people love to get access to private source code is through phishing. So here's an example from a friend of mine called Philippe, who's a pen tester. He was targeting a company, and one of the objectives was to try and get access to the private source code repositories, find secrets, move into pipelines, that type of thing. So he bought a, a website called gitlhub.com and to try and fish them, right? You can probably see this Git L Hub was just an exact mirror. So if you went to it, you wouldn't see anything wrong with it. And he was trying to get someone to log in to Git L Hub. So obviously, he created a, a nice phishing campaign, phishing email. And now is when you expect me to say that the user clicked on it, and he got access to everything. It didn't happen. The user didn't click on the email, and Philippe didn't get access. I know it sounds like a crappy story, but it gets really good, trust me. So, but Philippe left Git L Hub running, right? He'll use it again later on. It's just the mirroring stuff. It's fine. We'll worry about it later. Then something weird happened. Someone posted on Twitter an open source repository but made a mistake and accidentally typed Git L Hub. Because it was a mirror, it still worked perfectly and no one found out about it. But then something weird happened and the search engine started indexing it. And then the search engine started delivering Git L Hub instead of GitHub. And Philippe didn't even know about this until one day he found out his logs were all full. And when he went to investigate it, he had tens of thousands of credentials from people that have logged into gitlhub.com. Yeah, Philippe is a good guy, but I'm sure this was a very tempting moment in his life as to what to do, you know. But uh, he, did, he did bring down the site, and it's, it's gone down now. But that's an example of you know, how you could get so much access into private source code. Um, other areas are. Uh, misconfigurations. So, you know, your .git folder. This is what happens. You go git init, creates a .git directory. This is where all your metadata for your Git repository is stored. All your history, everything is in this folder. But often what we see is that this folder gets accidentally leaked out there in the world. So Cyber News did some scanning, and they found 2 million accidentally exposed .git directories. So this is when you think your source code is public, but you've actually made it public by putting out there your .git directory. So this has happened uh, in lots of where this has actually happened. United Nations had some big breaches where they had a .git directory with some hard-coded credentials. I also found this one funny. They had another breach where they had the .git credentials file publicly accessible, which obviously gave access to source code. But this is something that regularly happens. And I said at the start, you know, this is the lazy man's version of hacking. So to kind of quickly show you how you could go about that, you know. Uh, if we take the example of Algolia.com, I'm picking them because they don't have any vulnerabilities and I don't want to expose anything. But we're not going to find an exposed .git directory on Algolia.com. So what we want to do is we want to use a tool, something like SubFinder, to basically come up with all of the subdomains for Algolia.com. 
And with a little bit of reconnaissance, we're obviously going to find a whole bunch more domains that are owned by Algolia, because it's, it's going to be the test.staging.production.algolia.com that's probably going to have your Git directory and your credentials out there. This is taking a little bit longer than normal. It's coming, it's coming. You're just going to have to, we'll do, oh, there we are, there we are. And so you can get all of these different things, and things like, you know, demo.algolia.com or something kind of server002.lon.algolia, that might be something that's quite interesting. Once we have that list, we can use something like Git Scanner, which is just a really simple tool that can uh, scan for a whole bunch of targets to say, you just jump in your list of URLs, and it will try and find, is, is there .git directories? Maybe vulnerable means that there is a .git directory there. You don't have permissions, but a little bit of fiddling around, you might be able to access into individual files and move their way. So this is a really simple way of finding credentials, and it works scarily well um, out there. So if you're interested, you know, this is just the process uh, that I took for that one there. So why does this happen? Why in source code are there so many secrets? Well, there's one kind of obvious scenario where when we're building something out, often you go to a developer and you say, I need to connect to this S3 bucket. I need to connect to this service. Here's a key. Can you please do that? And the first thing the developer does is hard code that credential just to check that it works, just to get the, get the connection established. But they're working on their own branch. And that developer is not an idiot, so he removes that key. 100 commits later, by the time it's ready, it goes down to merge. And you're looking at the latest version on the feature branch and the closest version on the master branch. And you don't see any credentials. It gets merged in there, and everyone forgets that there was a secret that was hard coded, even for just one commit. Right? It's in the history. Anyone that's tried to rewrite Git history in a large team will know the absolute torture that it is. So I'm willing to bet that it's going to stay in there for a long time. And then people say, well, oh, it doesn't happen to us because I squash all my his commits together at the end. It's still in your garbage bin. It's still there. It's slightly harder to find, but a motivated attacker can still find that, unless you take extra steps, at which point, just don't hard code the credential, <laughs> like seriously. Uh, but lots of other reasons. Logs and auto-generated files, debug logs have it. If you people that don't have .git ignore files in there to ignore these logs and different things, uh, heads in there. Secrets.txt, we find a lot of these. Uh, and there's you know, examples like Django projects or other projects give you example keys uh, for it. So there's lots of ways that this kind of gets out. But the biggest way is we see people just kind of regularly sharing them on Git because it's easy, right? It's a central place. Lots of developers need secrets. Put all the secrets in Git. Happy days. Um, at least, so they think. So it remains to be a massive problem. But it's not by itself. We've also got lots of secrets in different places like containers. So just like GitHub, we have Docker Hub. This is the largest place to store Docker images. There's more than 10 million publicly available Docker images here. And Docker is a great way to kind of ship out your, your application. But we often find lots of secrets in Docker images as well. Recent research uh, by a German university, RWTH University, uh, found that 8.5% of Docker images contained at least one plain text secret. So they did 337,000 Docker images. They found 52,000 private keys and 2,900 cloud keys. And they did something super cool in the research. They actually connected the private keys to public keys to see which ones are real so that they were, and what they gave access to, which was an extra step which I thought was really cool. We also did research on Docker images and found similar results, but this one's better and bigger, so I used this one instead. This is the name. Oh, huh? there we are. This is the name of the uh, research. It's publicly available. These are the authors on it. If you want to check it out, it's a, a great read. All right, but how has this happened? Publicly, surely an attack hasn't happened because of a public image and a Docker image. A very big attack happened because of this, which was the CodeCov incident of uh, in January 2021. So they had a public uh, Docker image. It's how. You used CodeCov. CodeCov was a code coverage tool that sits in your CI CD pipeline, checks how much of your app is being tested, right? Does something simple, doesn't have critical functionality, 
but it is in your CI CD environment, so it does have access to your environment secrets. Their public image had a plain text, hard coded credential. They had a bit of a weird architecture because that gave access to a, Google, a, a, a Microsoft Drive, I believe, that had a bash uploader script. Code Cove, the application, would call this bash uploader script in certain cases to be able to uh, perform different tasks. They, that key gave read write access to that bash uploader script, and the attackers were able to use that to turn Code Cove malicious. At the time, there was 20,000 targets that were affected by this, including things like Rapid7, HashiCorp, Monday.com, Twilio, and the attackers were really after one thing. What this malicious line of code that the attackers did was it said every time code cov runs, dump the environment variables and send them to me, the attacker. So dump all the secrets, send them to me. Now, some of them are saying, oh, that wouldn't happen to us because we use staging secrets in our test environments, not production secrets. A lot of companies, that would be true, but the attackers were after one particular type of secret, which was the GitHub access keys. They wanted access into private source code, in which they were able to move. Now, very rarely do I ever pick on companies and breaches, because I truly believe it can happen to anyone. I'm going to pick on one company, which is HashiCorp. I actually think HashiCorp is a great company. They build great products. Don't sue me. But um, I will pick on them for one minute. HashiCorp created a product called Vault one of the best secrets managers available on the market. And their whole pitch to this was that if you use Vault, you do not need to hard code credentials. Developers do not need access to credentials. The attackers made it into HashiCorp's private code repositories via the CodeCov attack, and HashiCorp had to announce that they had secrets that they had to revoke in their private repositories. If HashiCorp has secrets in their private repositories, absolutely no one is safe. <laughs> Um, so the first thing, if you want to have a look at, is you know why does this happen? A lot of people think that Docker images and containers are these magic black boxes. This is probably a little bit rudimentary for this audience. But if you use a tool called Dive, you can have a look inside a Docker image. And what you'll see is as we move through the layers, we'll see in green all these files being added. Right? These files are just source code. If you have, uh, it's not some magic black box when you create a Docker image. There's source code in there. It may not be human readable, but it can be reversed. And if you have a secret in there, it's going to be in there. So you can kind of understand that these aren't magic black boxes. And uh, we can very easily take a look at that. If you want to have a look at how to scan a Docker image, I can just use a tool here called ggshield. You don't need to decompile or anything. You just put the Docker image that you want. It will save that Docker image from Docker Hub. If it's not there, it will scan it. I think the internet's quite slow, so it might take quite a while. Um, but uh, inside this Docker image is a bunch of, oh, no, there we are, didn't take very long, a bunch of test keys. This is how easy it is to find out if there's secrets inside a Docker, a Docker container. So we're not, we're, again, we're not talking about any kind of special techniques here. There's lots of examples as to why this happens. So for example, we, I saw a lot, of, uh, re, uh, a lot of systems where they had something like a netrc file which was to connect to a, a package manager. And in their Docker file, they would add this file in, but then remove it at the end. So they would add in the credentials, use the credentials, and remove the files. But like history in your Git, you have history in your Docker image as well, so in your Docker file. So that, that credential is still in there. But lots of other reasons, and honestly, just a lot of hard-coded credentials for no real particular reason. The last thing that I want to talk about is finding secrets in uh, applications. This is a little bit like off topic for this conference, but it's absolutely wild, so I'm going to talk about it anyway. But uh, what are mobile applications? So when we look on the Play Store, we see all these. What, what are these? These are glorified zip folders, right? That's what they are, and that you can get back. A lot of people seem to think that once you create uh, an application that that's it. No one will be able to read that apart from your mobile phone. It's not true. It's extremely easy to get back to the original source code uh, from this. So, and this comes from the assumption that all things non-human readable are secure. But that's absolutely not true. And uh, we find a lot of this when it comes into looking for, uh, for secrets. So with Apple, we have an IPA file. With Android, we have a .apk. Apple is slightly harder to get back to the original source code. Uh, you can literally turn this into a zip and unzip it, but, and you'll get access to a lot of files, but not the core binary. But the Android, you can just uh, decompile that and get right back to the, to the source code. 
So if we have a quick look at, at how to do that, I have an Android app in here in, in my folder. If we, if we wanted to have a quick look in this, then we can use a tool called JDEX to decompile this. And in a few seconds, we'll get right back to the original source code of this Android app, which we can start to see here. And the, the files that we're most interested in are things like the, the Android manifest.xml or the strings.xml. So once we find these, you know, we can very quickly uh, start looking through this and try and find any, any secrets that we might have. So the Android manifest is one that comes up. So really easy to get back to that. We can also scan this now for secrets. Uh, this, is a, a real, uh, this is a real app. I'll come back in a minute to this. This is a real app that I got from the Play Store uh, that I did. I've obfuscated the name, and I've removed, and I've hidden all the secrets, so I'm not exp exploiting any vulnerabilities. But this was absolutely, uh, what happened here? But this one was absolutely wild of what was in here. I'll come back in a second, because I'm running out of time. But this is just the workflow that I used to get into here. Um, so super easy, right? None of this is, is, is particularly amazing. Are there breaches where this happens? Yep, lots of them. This one was shared uh, on my podcast, free plug, uh, by Jason Haddix, uh, who was uh, looking into mobile applications. He, had a mo he was doing a pen test on a bank. And this is quite a, a, a large bank in the United States. He discovered that the bank was taking images. You could take an image of a check, because you still use checks in America, um, and you could cache that with your mobile phone. Those images were being stored without being encrypted on the phone, and then they were being sent to an Amazon S3 bucket, of which the hard-coded keys were in there in the app. Right? Now, why on earth would you do this? I guess it comes down to like thinking you're being efficient, because if you had to go through the back end, that's another step. right? Just connect directly to the bucket. Um, but obviously, we all know that that's insecure. But how many, how many uh, secrets are in mobile applications? Again, CyberNews did some large scaling scanning, and they found about 56% had hard-coded secrets. Now, this is a big sensational number. There's a little bit of context in here, because it doesn't mean that 56% have vulnerabilities where I can get into their infrastructure and get into their buckets, but a lot does. The number one key that they found was Google storage buckets, but also things like Firebase URLs. Now, these aren't sensitive by default, but if you have a misconfiguration, they can be pretty catastrophic. So huge numbers of secrets that we find in, in mobile applications. And if I go quickly back to it, here is the, the, the application that I scanned. We have some Slack webhooks uh, here. I have some Google APIs. This one is valid. So it lets me know which ones are valid. We have some more Google API keys. Uh, I have a valid Slack webhook. This is great for phishing campaigns, because you can post directly into a Slack channel. Um, so you know, really good things. There's even Facebook, valid Facebook keys, OAuth, Google OAuth keys, lots of good stuff in here. Um, and that was, I just downloaded 10, and that was kind of the second worst, because the worst one was too bad to show you. Uh, so how do we prevent this? Well, number one, the number one reason is to don't hard code your secrets, right? The, but it's going to happen any way your developers are going to do it, particularly momentarily. Uh, we also should be using the correct secrets manager, which may not always be the best. It's counterintuitive, but use the secrets managers that your developers will actually use. So up the top, I've talked about it. You know, things like HashiCorp Vault are amazing, but they can be very heavy. And so if you don't have a team to manage that properly, maybe that's not for you. There are SaaS providers like Akeelis or 1Password has some good ones um, uh, for there. Your cloud features have secrets managers, and these are great to use, particularly if you're already familiar with them. And then there's, if you're going to put secrets in Git, please don't. But if you are going to do it, and I can't convince you not to, please encrypt them first. Right? There are tools out there to encrypt your secrets. But that is not a good secrets management strategy. I just want to be clear, because that gives you a single point of failure. Uh, use automated secret detection. I work for GitGuardian, so I'm wildly biased, but they're definitely the best. Um, but there's also open source tools, Trufflehog, GitLeaks, Yelp Detect Secrets. There's no excuse not to do secret detection in your pipelines. Use Git hooks, rotate regularly, limit privileges, whitelist services. So just zero trust stuff. And with that, uh, I've come to the end. So thank you. Here's some QR codes. Oh.
Thanks, Mackenzie. I feel a lot less secure now. Um, <laughs> we have time for one question. Do you know if uh, your tool is used for uh, capture of flag? If our tool is used for what, sorry? For uh, CTF. Capture the flag. Oh, yeah. Yeah, our tools are. We actually have some CTFs that were in there. Um, and we, yeah, we have. There, there was one incident where, a very, where it caused a little bit of trouble, too, because there was a, a pretty widespread breach that happened. And then in the investigation, it found out that our tools were being used by the bad guys, which was a little bit difficult to explain. But uh, at the end of the day, we have open source tools. People are going to use them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mackenzie.